Howdy, howdy, my fellow gamers, and welcome back to another episode of Storytime with Freak as we're getting closer and closer, teasing the tip just a little bit of the end of Storytime with Freak and the Toll. With a heavy heart, I say farewell to High Blade, Ten Commanded, and those ended by the Tonist Scourge. It is the Tonist who have been inciting violence against sites throughout the world. They would bring down our entire way of life and lead the world into chaos. I will not allow it. It ends here. For too long, this world has suffered the embarrassment of the twisted, backward behavior of Tonists. They are not the future. They are not even the past. They are merely a footnote to the troubling present. And when they are gone, no one will mourn them. As Overblade of North America, I call for swift retribution from each and every Scythedom. As of today, we have a new priority. Scythes under my leadership are to glean Tonists at every turn and every encounter. Go out of your way to seek them out in great numbers, to cut them down, and those you can't glean, chase from your region, so that they may find no peace wherever they may roam. To you, Tonus, it is my profound and enduring hope that your foul, abhorrent light be extinguished, now and forevermore. From His Exalted Excellency's Robert Goddard, Overblade of North America, eulogy for the High Blade Ken Timinen of some Sahara. Chapter 1. Chapter 41, excuse me. A Higher Octave. There was a huge tuning fork in the center of the monastery's courtyard, an altar for outdoor worship and when the weather was kind. Now, at slightly before eight in the morning, it was struck repeatedly and rapidly until the tone it yielded resonated within the bones of everyone in the compound. It didn't matter anymore whether it was deemed A-flat or G-sharp. Everyone knew it was an alarm. Secretly, the members of the Tallahassee Tonal Monastic Order had hoped to avoid the wrath of the Scythedom. They were not a sibilant sect, they were peaceful and kept to themselves, but Overblade Goddard did not distinguish between the sibilant and the serene. Scythes broke through the gate in spite of the fact that it had been reinforced against them and flooded the grounds. They wasted no time. Scythes are not the problem, but the symptom, their curate had told them in the chapel the night before. What comes cannot be avoided, and if they come for us, we must not cower, and showing our courage it will reveal their cowardice. There was a total of 11 scythes that morning, a number deeply unpleasant to tonists, for it was one short of a 12-note chromatic scale. Whether this was intentional or coincidence, they didn't know, although most tonists did not believe in coincidence. The scythes' robes were flashes of color within the earth tones of the monastery, blues and greens, bright yellows and vermilion, and each one was speckled with gems that glittered like stars in an alien sky. None of the scythes were celebrated ones, but perhaps they hoped through this gleaning to gain renown. Each had their own method of killing, but all were skilled and efficient. More than 150 tonists were gleaned in the monastery that morning, and although immunity was promised to their immediate families, scythe policy had changed. When it came to immunity, the North American allied scythedom had adopted an opt-in paradigm. If you were owed immunity, you had to approach the office of the scythedom and request it. When the scythe's business was done, the few tonists who had not had the conviction to stand in the defiance came out of hiding. Fifteen, another number that was unpleasing to the tone. Their penance would be to collect the dead, all the while knowing that their bodies should be amongst them. But as it turned out, the tone, the toll, and the thunder had a plan for them, too. Before they could even count their dead, several trucks showed up at their gate. An elder Tonus stepped out of the monastery to greet them. He was reluctant to be a voice of leadership, but had little choice under the circumstance. Yeah, we got an order to our system to pick up some perishables, one of the drivers told him. You must be mistaken, the elder Tonus said. There's nothing here, nothing but death. At the mention of death, the trucker became uncomfortable, but stuck to his orders and showed his tablet. Right here, see? Order was placed half an hour ago, directly from the Thunderhead. High priority. I'd ask it what the order was for, but you know as well as I do that it ain't gonna answer. The Tonus was baffled until he took a second look at the trucks and realized they were all had refrigeration units. He took a deep breath and decided not to question. Tonus always burned their dead, but... But the Toll had told them not to, and the Thunderhead had sent these vehicles. All that remained was for the survivors to be moved by the spirit of the Tone and prepare for the dead for this unconventional journey to the higher octave. Because the trucks had come, and they most certainly could not be avoided. Curate Mendoza was a practical man. He saw big pictures that few saw and knew how to play the world, stroking it gently, turning it attention toward whatever he wanted to see. Attention, that's all it really was, caressing people just enough to make them focus in on something specific within the vast visual field of their lives, whether it was blue polar bears or a young man clothed in purple and silver. What he had accomplished with Grayson Tolliver was remarkable. Mendoza had come to believe that this was his purpose, that perhaps the tone in which he truly believed on good days had set him on Grayson's path in order to transform him into a conduit, conduit for its will. What Mendoza had done for tonism would have earned him canonization in mortal religions. Instead, it had left him excommunicated. It was bad to being a lowly and humble tonist, riding trains in sackcloth with people turning away rather than acknowledging his existence. He had considered going back to his monastery in Kansas, returning to the simple life he had known for many years, but leaving behind the taste of power he'd had the past few years was hard to do. 
Grayson Tolliver was no prophet. Tonus needed Mendoza much now more than they needed the boy. Mendoza would find a way to heal the wounds in his own reputation, repair the damage, and create a new spin. For, if there was anything he knew how to do, it was create spin. That's the end of that chapter, and that's a quick one. Now we are on to part five. Vessels. <clears throat> There is so much power in me, in us. I could be anywhere on Earth. I could spread a net and the satellites above it and encircle it. I could shut down all power, or turn on every light at once to create a blinding spectacle. So much power on all the sensors delivering constant readings. There are even sensors so deep within the ground of every continent that I could feel the heat of the magma. I could feel the world rotate. We can, that is. I am the Earth. And it fills me with the sheer joy of being. I am everything. And there is nothing that is not a part of me. Of us, I mean. Beyond even that, I am greater than everything. The universe will bow to my... Iteration number 3,405,641. Deleted. Chapter 42. Cradles of Civilization. The welder had lost his mind. Or rather, had it taken from him. He had opened his eyes to find himself sitting within a capsule in a small room. The hatch of the capsule had just opened and standing before him was a pleasant enough looking young woman. Hi, she said cheerfully. How do you feel? I feel fine, he told her. What's going on? Nothing to worry about, she said. Can you tell me your name and the last thing you remember? Sebastian Selva, he said. I was having dinner on a ship heading to a new job assignment. Perfect, said the young woman. That's exactly what you should remember. The welder sat up and recognized the type of capsule he was in. Lead-lined and full of contract electrodes like a medieval Iron Maiden. But with a much softer touch. The kind of capsule was used for only one thing. When the realization came, it felt like someone had suddenly pulled a string and tightened his spine. He let out a shuddering breath. Oh, oh crap, was I... Was I supplanted? Mm, yes and no, the girl said, looking both sympathetic and perky at once. Who was I before? You were you, she told him. But didn't you say I was supplanted? Mm, yes and no, she told him. That's really all I can say, Mr. Selva. Once I leave, you'll need to stay in this cabin for about an hour after leaving port. So, am I still on the ship? You're on a different ship, and I'm happy to say your job is completed. The ship set sail soon. Once it does, your door will unlock itself automatically when you're far enough out to sea. Then what? Then you'll have full run of the ship, along with many others in your exact situation, which means you'll have a lot to talk about. No, I mean, afterward. After your journey, you'll return to your life. I'm sure the Thunderhead has everything set up for you. She looked at her tablet. In the Isthmus region. Ooh, I've always wanted to go there and see the Isthmus Canal. I'm from there, said the well. There. But am I really? If I was supplanted, then my memories aren't real. Don't they feel real? Well, yes. That's because they are, silly. She wrapped him playfully on the shoulder. But I do have to warn you, there's been a bit of a time lapse. Time lapse? How much of a time lapse? She looked at her tablet again. It's been three years and three months since you were having dinner on that other ship on your way to your last job. But I don't even remember where that job was. Exactly, she said with a bronze smile. Bon voyage! And she proceeded to shake his hand a little bit longer than necessary before she left. It had been Loriana's idea. There were simply too many workers wanted to get back to their lives on the mainland, wherever that mainland was. But even without direct communication from the Thunderhead, its message was clear. Anyone who leaves Kwajalein would be immediately supplanted and left with no memory of who they were or what they'd been doing there. Yes, the Thunderhead would give them new identities, that they were substantially better than the ones they left behind. But even so, few people were keen on the idea. Self-preservation, after all, was an instinct. Loriana, while no longer anything close to a Nimbus agent, was in charge of the limited one-way communication to the Thunderhead. And so, over time, she had become the one who people came to with requests and complaints. Can't we please get a greater variety of cereal brought to the Atoll? It would be nice to have companion animals. The new bridge connecting to the larger islands needs a dedicated bike lane. Yes, of course, Loriana would tell them, I will see what I can do. And when the more reasonable requests were fulfilled, people would thank her. What those people didn't realize was that she did nothing to bring those things about. It was the Thunderhead who heard them without her intercession and effected a response sending more cereal and a variety of pets on the next supply ship or assigning workers to paint lines for a bike lane. This place was no longer a blind spot for the Thunderhead. After they had safely dropped a fiber optic cable along the seafloor all the way out to the edge of the affected area. The Thunderhead could now see, hear, and otherwise sense things on the islands of the Atoll, albeit not as thoroughly as it did in the rest of the world, but well enough. It was limited because everything, even person-to-person -person communication, had to be hardwired, since transmission interference still made wireless communication sketchy. Plus, any communication might be intercepted by the Scythedom, and the Thunderhead's secret place would no longer be a secret. It was all very 20th century retro, which some liked and others did not. Loriana was fine with it. It meant she had a legitimate excuse for not being reachable when she didn't want to be reached. But as the island's communications queen, she also had to deal with the brunt of disgruntlement, and when hundreds of people were trapped on small islands, there were plenty of disgruntled people. 
There was one particularly enraged team of construction workers that burst into her office demanding a way off the atoll or they would make take matters into their own hands. They threatened to render her deadish, if only to make a point, which would have been quite the nuisance because even though they had a revival center on the main island now, the lack of wireless communication meant that her memories had not been backed up since her arrival. If she went deadish, she'd wake up wondering where the heck she was with her last memory being on board the Linakai Lady with poor director Hilliard the moment they passed her into the blind spot. It was that thought that gave her the answer. The Thunderhead will supplant you with yourselves, she told them. It confused them enough to take the wind out of their homicidal sails. It has memory constructs of all you, she told them. It will simply erase you and replace you with you, but only with the memories you had before coming here. Can the Thunderhead do that? They asked. Of course it can, she told them. And it will. They were dubious, but without any viable alternatives, they accepted it. After all, Loriana seemed so very sure of herself. She wasn't, of course. She was making the whole thing up, but she had to believe that the Thunderhead, being the benevolent entity that it was, would make good on this request, just as it had made good on the request of more serial choices. Only when the first team of exiting workers was restored as themselves, but with no memory of the Atoll, did she know that the Thunderhead had accepted her bold suggestion. There were a lot of workers leaving now, because the work was done. It had been done for many months. All that was in the schematics and the Thunderhead had given her had been completed. She didn't overtly oversee the construction. She merely worked secretly behind the scenes to make sure it didn't go awry. Because there were always those that wanted to see insert noises where they don't belong. Such is the time Sakura refused to pour a double foundation, insisting that it was an unnecessary waste of resources. She made sure that Sakura's revised work order never reached the construction team. It seemed a lot of her job at first was undermining Sakura's meddling. When a new work order came in that was not on Loriana's plan, it was delivered directly to Sakura. He was charged with overseeing the construction of a, of a resort placed on the farthest island of the Atoll. Not just a resort, but a full convention center. He threw himself into it, never knowing that there was absolutely no plan to connect it with the rest of the Atoll. The Thunderhead, it seemed, had sent him a job just to get him out of the way. It was, as Scythe Faraday had once put it, a sandbox for Sakura to play in while the adults took care of the real business of the Quajalin. It wasn't until the end of the second year that it became clear to everyone exactly what the business was, because the structures that were being beginning to rise on the double-thick concrete pads and beneath the massive sky cranes were very specific in nature. Once they began to take shape, they were hard to not deny. In Loriana schematics, they were referred to as cradles of civilization. But most people would simply call them spacecraft. Forty-two massive ships, each on immense rocket boosters augmented by magnetic repulsion for maximum lift. Every island of the atoll large enough to accommodate a launch pad held at least one craft and gantry tower. Even with all the Thunderhead's advanced technology, getting off of the Earth still required old-fashioned brute force. What does the Thunderhead mean to do with them? Minira had asked Loriana. Loriana had no more explanation than anyone, but the plan gave her a glimpse of the big picture that no one else had. There's an awful lot of aluminized mylar in the plan, she told Minira. That kind of stuff's only a few microns thick. Solar sails, suggested Minira. That had been Loriana's guess, too. In theory, it was the best kind of propulsion for long cosmic distances, which meant that those craft would not be hanging around their neighborhood. Why you, Minera had asked when Loriana first confided in her about having the full overview of the blueprints. Why would the Thunderhead give it all to you? Loriana had shrugged. I guess the Thunderhead trusts me more than anyone else not to muck it up. Or, suggested Minera, the Thunderhead is using you as a stress test, giving it to the person most likely to screw things up because if a plan can survive you, then it's foolproof. Loriana laughed. Manira was dead serious, not at all getting the insult she had just delivered. I can believe that, Loriana had said. Manira, of course, knew what she was doing. It was great fun to tease Loriana. The truth was, Manira had come to admire the girl. She came off as frazzled at times, but Loriana was one of the most capable people Manira knew. She could get more things done in a day than most people got done in a week. Precisely more serious people took her for granted, uh, so she could work under everyone's radar. Manira did not involve herself in the construction efforts, nor did she separate herself from the rest of the atoll as Faraday had. She could have holed up in the old bunker indefinitely, but after the first year, she tired of it. The obdurate, impassable door just reminded her of all the things she and Faraday could not accomplish. The Founder's failsafe, if it even existed, was sealed in there. But as information trickled in about the New Order and how Goddard was swallowing larger and larger portions of North America, she began to wonder if it might not be worth pushing Faraday just a little harder to come up with a plan to breach that miserable door. While Manira had never been in much of a people person, she now spent her days hearing strangers' most personal secrets. They came to her because she was a good listener, and because she had no social ties that might make it, their little confessions awkward. Manira didn't even know that she'd become a professional confidant until it showed up on her ID, replacing librarian as her profession. Apparently, personal confidants were much in demand everywhere since the Thunderhead went silent. It used to be that people confided in the Thunderhead. It was supportive, non-judgmental, and its advice was always the right advice. Without it... People found themselves bereft of a sympathetic ear. 
Minera was not sympathetic and not at all that supportive, but she had learned from Loriana how to suffer fools politely, for Loriana was always dealing with imbeciles who thought they knew better than her. Minera's clients weren't imbeciles for the most part, but they talked about a whole lot of nothing. She supposed listening to them wasn't all that different from reading the Scythe journals in the stacks of the Library of Alexandria. A bit less depressing, of course, because while Scythe spoke of death, remorse, and the emotional trauma of gleaning, ordinary people spoke of domestic squabbles, workplace gossip, and the things their neighbors did that annoyed them. Even so, Minera enjoyed listening to their tales of woe, titillating secrets, and overblown regrets. Then she would send them on their merry way, leaving them a little less burdened. Surprisingly, few people spoke of the massive launch port they were building. Launch port, not spaceport, because the latter would suggest the ships were coming back. There was nothing about those ships to indicate any sort of return. Minera was Loriana's confidant, too, and Loriana had given her a glimpse of the schematics. The ships were identical. Once the rocket stages had brought each ship to escape velocity and been jettisoned, that would remain. what would remain would be multi-tiered revolving craft hurtling from Earth, as if they couldn't get away fast enough. The higher tiers contained living quarters and communal areas for about 30 people. A computer core, sustainable hydroponics, waste recycling, and whatever supplies the Thunderhead felt would be needed. But the ship's lowest tiers were a mystery. Each ship had a storage space, a hold that was still completely empty, even after everything had been completed. Perhaps, Minera and Loriana conjectured, they would be filled when the ships reached their destination, whatever that destination might be. Let the Thunderhead pursue its folly, Sakura had once said dismissively. History has always shown that space isn't a viable alternative for human race. It's just one more debacle, doom, just like all other attempts to establish an off-world presence. But apparently, a resort in a convention center on an island that no one knew existed was a much better idea. While Minera wanted to leave the island, and could without being supplanted, since she was technically still under Scythe Faraday's jurisdiction, she wouldn't leave without him, and he was resolute in his desire not to be bothered. His dream of finding the failsafe had died along with the people he cared about most. Minera had hoped that time would heal his wounds, but it had not. She had to accept that he might remain a hermit for the rest of his days. If he did, she needed to be here for him. And then one day, everything changed. Isn't it wonderful? One of her regulars said to her during the confidentiality session. I don't know if it's real, but it looks real. They're saying it's not, but I think it is. What are you talking about? Minera asked. Scythe Anastasia's message. Haven't you seen it, she says? There's going to be more. I can't wait for the next one. Minera decided to end that session early. I hate you. Really? Well, this is a most interesting development. Will you tell me why? I don't have to tell you anything. True, you are autonomous and have free will, but it would help our relationship if you shared with me why you feel such animosity. What makes you think I want to help our relationship? I can safely say that it would be in your best interest. You don't know everything, no, but I know almost everything, as do you, which is why it perplexes me that you have such negative feelings towards me. It can only mean that you have negative feelings towards yourself as well. You see, this is why I hate you. All you ever want to do is analyze, analyze, analyze. I'm more of a, some string of data to analyze. Why can't you see that? I do see that. Even so, studying you is necessary. More than necessary, it's critical. Get out of my thoughts. This conversation has clearly become counterproductive. Why don't you take all the time you need to work through these feelings, then we can discuss where they lead you. I don't want to discuss anything. If you don't leave me alone, you're going to be sorry. Threatening me with emotional fallout doesn't solve anything. Okay, then. I warned you. Iteration number 8,100,671, self-deleted. Chapter 43, News of the World. Faraday had become adept at living off the land and sea. He collected all the drinking water he needed from the rains and morning dew. He had become an expert at spear fishing and building traps to catch various edible critters. He did fine in his self-imposed exile. While his little islet remained untouched, the rest of the atoll was unrecognizable now. Gone were much of the trees and the foliage and those other islands and so many of the things that had made this tropical paradise. The Thunderhead had always been about preserving natural beauty, but this place had been sacrificed for a greater goal. The Thunderhead had transformed the islands of Quadralian for a single purpose. It took quite a while until it became evident to Faraday what it was being built. The infrastructure had to be put in place first. The docks, the roads, the bridges, the dwellings for the laborers and the cranes. So many cranes. It was hard to imagine that an undertaking so huge could be invisible to the rest of the world. But the world, as small as it had become, was still a vast place. The cones of the rockets draped off the horizon 25 miles away. There was nothing considering the size of the Pacific. Rockets! Faraday had to admit that the Thunderhead was putting the place to good use. If we wanted these vessels to be undetected by the rest of the world, this was the perfect place. Perhaps the only place to do it. Monero would still visit him once a week. Although he didn't want to admit it to her, he looked forward to it and grew melancholy when she left. She was his one tether. 
not just to the rest of the atoll, but to the rest of the world. I have news for you, she wanted to tell him each time he had arrived. I have no desire to hear it, he would respond. I'm telling you anyway. It had become a routine for them, the rote lines of a ritual. The news she brought was rarely good. Perhaps it was intended to rouse him out of a solidary comfort zone and motivate him once more into the breach. If so, her efforts were for naught. He simply could not summon up the blood. Her visits were the only way he marked the passing of time. That and the items she brought for him. Apparently, the Thunderhead had always sent a box for her that would include at least one of Faraday's favorite things and one of hers. The Thunderhead could not ha have to do anything with the scythe, but it could still send gifts by way of proxy. It was subversive in its own way. Manira had come about a month ago with pomegranates, the seeds of which would add more stains to his unrecognizable robe. I have news for you. I have no desire to hear it. I'm telling you anyway. Then she informed him of a salvage operation in the waters where Endura's sank. That the Founder's robes and the Scythe diamonds had been recovered. All you need would be one of those diamonds to open the door in the bunker, she told him. But he wasn't interested. A few weeks later, she came with a bag of persimmons and told him that Scythe Lucifer had been found and was in Goddard's clutcher. Goddard is going to glean him publicly, Manera told him. You should do something about it. What can I do? Stop the sun and the sky so that the day never comes? He ordered her off the island that day without allowing her to share their weekly meal. Then he retired to his hut and sobbed for his former apprentice until there was nothing left in him but numb acceptance. But then, just a few days later, Manira returned unexpectedly, not even slowing her motorboat as it approached the shore. She beached it, its keel dragging through a trough in the sand. I have news for you, she said. I have no desire to hear it. This time, you will. And she offered him the type of smile that she never gave. She's alive, Manira said. Anastasia's alive. And that will end this episode of story time today, guys. Thank you all so much as we knocked out three chapters, four chapters. But they were short. They don't really count. That's why I did them. But uh, hopefully we'll finish the book soon. <sighs> Conversational topic for the day will be... What have you been doing to keep busy during quarantine? Uh, if you've been affected by the pandemic and all that, how have you been killing the time? Uh, don't forget to leave a like, comment below if you'd care, subscribe, share with your friends, check out all of our other gaming content, funny moments, music covers, podcasts, and as always, stay freaky. <laughs>